Hello, Andy. How how are you doing today? I'm doing very thank very thanks. That's exactly <laughs> how I'm doing. I'm doing very good. Thanks. Um, it's uh it's show week, but it's uh is is obviously not just any show, is it? So um, yeah. it's uh, it's a little bit busier than usual. Um, but we're good, and uh, we're looking forward to it all being over. Um, and shouting lots at Wembley Stadium. Um, at the end of the week to let out all my frustrations that I've built up um, over the past few weeks, months, whatever it's been now, I've lost track. Yeah, as you said, it's not just any show. It's your biggest show ever, your 11th anniversary at the Copper Box on Saturday. How does it feel you're now a decade into RevPro preparing for this milestone event? It kind of makes me feel old yeah. in many respects. Yeah. Um, and in the uh i guess in the kind of lead up to it i've been kind of looking back across stuff that we've done throughout the history of revolution pro wrestling it does make you almost stop and appreciate how far we've come in, in what is a relative short amount of time considering the resources we've had to progress the whole thing forward um so I guess as as far as kind of self reflection goes, um, it's a, it's a big positive, and I wish that I guess there'd been more times when I was able to step back and appreciate how much we've done over these past eleven years. Um, mm. And and it's almost like I, at this stage, I don't really have time to appreciate it, apart from going, oh yeah, we did that. That was nice. Now on to the next piece of paperwork. Um, so I guess it's it, it does feel quite surreal though. Um, I, I said to people before like you know if, if people said to me 11 years ago um where do you see revolution pro wrestling in the future 10 years from now for example I, my answer would be i honestly don't know but all i know is we'll still be here and we'll still be plugging away um i honestly think we could get as big as we've got in terms of that worldwide recognition um, and people thinking we're worth column inches and, um, you know, media time amongst all of this massive wrestling, which is currently available to, um, for us to be relevant to worldwide wrestling media. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have believed that because I guess my mission statement at the start was just to improve the standards of British professional wrestling. Um, I didn't ever think we could do anything on that worldwide scope. Um, and then you look at the the milestones along the way, for example, running the first short call show, which we did June 2013. Um, and when we did that, it was almost like that was as big as it could get for British wrestling, for Revolution Pro Wrestling. Um, and it was a question of, can we pull that off? Are we going to be able to run one show at York Hall Bethnal Green, let alone, I don't know, we must have run about 50 at York Hall now. And we've literally turned um, just that famous combat sports venue into just another home of British wrestling. It's a home of British boxing, but I think you could argue it's also the home of British wrestling now as well, because um, it's uh, it's known worldwide for so many of those huge dream matches and just the atmosphere it's able to create. Um, so we've done all that. Um, and now we're come into a cobble box arena um mm -hmm. and will the, I, I think the thing which is exciting for me i always want to move forward i always want to be progressing everything forward and i think the thing which is perhaps most exciting for me is um is this just going to be one and done at the copper box or is this going to be like that first your call show you know where people said you can't do it and yeah. i said well let's give it a go and see what happens so again ask me where we're we going to be 10 years from now the answer is i don't know but I know we'll still be here and we'll, we'll be progressing forward in some way. I try to only can compare myself to myself yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not looking at what other people are doing. Of course, you know, I'm, I am in a, in a sense of like, it would be stupid not to understand the marketplace, not to study, not to approach everything with an open mind. Um, but in terms of comparisons, it's not a competition with anyone apart from myself. So, yeah, it's it's been quite the journey, and uh, it seems very appropriate forward slash surreal that we're we're yeah. coming to a couple of boxes Saturday. Um, before we talk about like the the other big show that's happening this weekend at Wembley, like with the ten years you've had in business as a British wrestling promoter on your own 
little island here. How have like the different things you've seen changing in the American landscape with like the ups and downs of WWE um, impact, obviously AW being formed and then even the popularity that New Japan got in America. How have you seen that like affect you or you do you kind of like keep your head down and keep going or what have those changes been like? Honestly, I think that's a fantastic question um, because everything you know so it's the butterfly effect isn't it yeah. everything has a knock-on effect so even if you don't see it the smallest ripple um has it has a reaction even even to us mm -hmm. um so i guess look when i first started watching wrestling we'd be looking at former wwf superstars my first the first show i went to was the bushwhackers but you yeah. know i don't know marty Janetti and Jimmy Anvil Nightheart, Jake the Snake, you know, uh, Virgil, guys mm -hmm. like that. Once when I was little, um, I was I had a picture with Virgil and I had like loads of coins and I was so nervous I dropped all my coins everywhere and he helped <laughs> me pick them up. But um that's another story. Um <laughs> you made him in coins. <laughs> yeah. But then I did get a picture with him many years later. Um yeah. and, um, and uh yeah, he I thought he would love the love the story, but no, he just wanted no. my money. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, so, so that was kind of what it was, because it was like almost yeah. these larger than life superstars. Um, and, you know, they would have a, a shelf life within WWF. So, you know, uh, I guess stars, you'd have your enduring stars, but I guess the rest of the stars would be cycled in and out. Everyone was disposable. And I guess mm -hmm. it was kind of more akin to the territory days in many ways, apart from the guys never had anywhere else to go. So they they made a living in the UK doing little tours of the UK. Um, and that's how it was then. Now, when I first started um, getting into kind of, I guess the business side of the business, um, it was the independent names. And that's obviously you can see there's an influence, uh, you know, in, in what we do by, uh, and when I say independent names, you know, we're talking about guys like AJ Styles, Christopher yeah. Daniels, Jerry Lynn, um, and, I guess I'm thinking about more progressive wrestling, more forward thinking wrestling um, and um, and wrestlers more in their primes or coming into their primes and wrestlers who, um, you know, were future stars, but because there wasn't, the world was just so different. It was tape trading, right? So yeah. people, um, you know, there will be a wrestler that would become a flavor of the month based around bootleg videotapes being sold at these wrestling shows. Mm -hmm. And so people would people would literally come to these wrestling shows. The, the wrestling was probably secondary. It was mm -hmm. more a case of getting your grubby mitts on the latest independent professional wrestling show. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and as a result, names amongst that crowd, so it was dealing with a very small niche, names amongst that crowd were... Um, would would become cult favorites so that's kind of how aj styles became big in the uk mm -hmm. before tna was even a thing so um so that was kind of crazy um but i guess in terms of trends of the, the business um when tna came um it was kind of good in a sense of the names that wrestled for tna instantly became um bigger stars i think specifically because of the the tv coverage that tna had over here um, so, so those guys instantly became bigger stars and they were accessible. The WWE guys were never accessible. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, well, I think perhaps they were when, you know, years and years ago, um, I know like in Attitude Era, you'll still be able to book out The Undertaker, for example, and it would be crazy if that was still the case now, you know. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the TNA guys in many ways are accessible, um, but they also drove a much higher price. Mm -hmm. and, some of those guys perhaps weren't um i don't want to say they weren't worth that price because i believe everyone's worth more than they get paid i yeah. just believe i'm not paying enough money to see them but that's another story but um i think that you know it, it did make it difficult but like the lower level tna guys for example it was difficult to to justify booking them because despite the fact they were bigger stars they'd be commanding the higher wage mm. um and there was also that flourishing independent scene as well, those people that didn't go with TNA. So, like, for example, um, you know, like the Young Bucks obviously had their run with TNA. Yeah. Um, TNA obviously misused them, mishandled them, however you want to look at it. Um, and then they branched out on their own. And 
for a while, probably in terms of flourishing, in terms of being able to use independent talents, the best times was when Ring of Honor had the guys under contract, because obviously in America, the guys weren't allowed to work for work for any other North American promotions, but they were allowed to work overseas. So any time that Ring of Honor had off, you know, all of these guys were under Ring of Honor, Honor contract were available. And the chances were they were available because they're not allowed to work anywhere else apart from overseas. So it was it was quite easy to get access to talent. Yeah. Uh, so that that kind of helped. Um, and then I guess where we, you know, the, when WWE started trying to compete with Ring of Honor, I'd say with NXT, that's when stuff became a lot harder because they started signing up literally all the independent talent that was available. Any named Ring of Honor talent was getting signed up. Um, so that was difficult in terms of using talent there because, again, it just became slimmer pickings to choose from. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd probably say since AEW came along, like it's been great for professional wrestling in general in terms of um, being able to use, uh, be, uh, you know, wrestlers being able to earn money. But it's taken that pool of independent talent, which is freely available, down even smaller. Yeah. Now, it's absolutely fantastic that AEW do allow their talents to work outside events. And that's, you know, that's great. But obviously, um, they're very busy. Schedules are hard to um, to confirm very far in advance. Um, so you're working with variables all the time, you know. So like, for example, you saw Mox booked for an OTT show. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, an AEW schedule changed. And therefore, his schedule changed. He was unable to do the show. And obviously... That's a, that's a risk you take when you're you know when you're working with contracted talents. So whilst it's great having that um, you know that um, opportunity to use those talents, it comes with risks. Um, and of course, I guess for me, you know, New, being able to having that relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling is great as well because that gives me access to another pool of talent. Um, but again, it's within the schedules of New Japan and New Japan are very, very busy, um, especially now they've got New Japan strong in um, operating in America. Um, and obviously, I feel that they're, they're working more shows now, um, which I guess may be trying to play catch up from COVID because um, there's a lot of New Japan shows going on at the moment and there's yeah. very rarely a weekend where they're not on. So, um, you know, there's highs and lows. Um, there's positives and negatives of, of everything throughout the years. Um, and now I'd say we're kind of in that medium ground. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's cool. There, there are a lot of good available talents, um, but I guess as you, you have to be very, very flexible and be able to meet a number of conditions, and you know, um, and be prepared to not have everything confirmed. You know, a few months in advance, um, but. Um, yeah, the glory time, it coincided with what I think everyone traditionally looks as the UK boom, uh, you know, that 2015-16 period. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're just, you know, you could be in, in the UK on any given weekend. There could be, you know, in five different cities, top tier imported talent. Uh, and that's because the numbers were there. Um, so, I, you know, I don't really think the numbers are as there now as they were. But mm -hmm. we're still in a position where we're able to put on some, you know, pretty cool matches. So I'm not complaining, you know. Yeah. Um. What's your relationship with Tony Khan like? I mean, he like he used to go to Rev Pro shows, right? Yeah, when he was, uh, in, I guess before AEW, he was based a yeah. lot more in London than he is now. He just does these fly and visits. I've got no idea how he's able to <laughs> operate, you know, going from one time zone to another and oper operating such high level business. And look, I know the demands of the professional wrestling business more than anyone. Um, and to think that he's able to do that whilst operating, a, I don't know anything about NFL, but, you know, like whilst operating an NFL franchise and... Fulham Football Club, who are obviously, for anyone watching in America, just obviously a huge, huge deal that I think is often understated in terms of Tony Khan's workload. Um, but yeah, when he was in UK more, um, I saw him in the, in the lead up to, I guess, the formation of AEW. So I guess yeah. doing a bit of background research as well. Um, but yeah, like I, I get along with Tony. Um, he uh, He's probably, again, he he made a quip at the the press conference about my ability to reply to text messages. I always reply to his. So <laughs> I hope he replies to that. Um, but like he's a uh, just the way like 
his accessibility is insane considering you know everything that he does um and he he does reply to messages and he gets back real quick and he, you know if you get him you know i can see he's one of these people when he's in the zone it's just like um he likes hammering stuff out there and then yeah. you know um, yeah uh, but yeah, I like I, I like Tony Khan a lot. I respect him so much. Um, I'm so impressed with um, everything that he's able to do, his vision and uh, and his balls, I guess, to be able to everything that he's done takes balls, you know. And I feel like I don't know. Like I think there's a lot of people, and and they, look, don't get me wrong, he's got resources, and when you've got resources, it's a lot easier to be confident. <laughs> but still. You know, he's to everything, every decision he's he makes, he's taking a huge risk. And he knows he's the face of this whole operation. And there's people, this industry is crazy. Like people just want people to fail. Like even what, what I find most crazy about it. So look, I can understand if you are someone who's a high level executive in WWE wanting your competition to fail. Yeah. Right? However, competition does breed um better results for everyone look wwe right now is having a resurgence which i can guarantee you would not be going on if it wasn't for AEW, right yeah. competition makes us all better right but any wrestler or any wrestling fan that wants AEW to fail it just blows my mind because it gives you other places to work it gives you other wrestling to work you know um i couldn't when AEW first started i couldn't watch wwe it was it was for me it was at a time when you know i try to i still regardless i always try to watch it mm -hmm. right but you know, it was such a chore to get through shows yeah um and AEW was a, a breath of fresh air and it was never perfect but it, it had it catered to me my inner wrestling fan more right and then wwe started to get better and i started to get a bit more interest in WWE mm -hmm. and now you've got collision which for me uh it's more my style of wrestling you know and so now I'm I'm kind of more invested in collision but like I don't know I just feel that without one the other flounders somewhat yeah you know, as wrestling fans and as people who work inside wrestling the more places you got to work and the more good wrestling you got to watch the better and the more we push each other to improve the better so um so yeah i just find it kind of crazy that people were you know they target tony and stuff because for me like look he's it's very rare you get the right people you mm -hmm. know who've got creativity who've got resources who want to put it into professional wrestling yeah so you know they, they say like how do you make a million in the wrestling business start with 10 million you know <laughs> yeah. like it's it's not a thankful it's a, you know it's a it's a thankless business um and even when you're doing well you know you've got people trying to knock you down mm -hmm. so uh so yeah for him he's you know and, and i see him bite sometimes i love it i love that side of him right because yeah. you know because i know like and again look I, what i get is a fraction of what Tony Khan must get, right? Yeah. Like, I know how much you have to bite your tongue, you know? And, yeah. like, for him to just bite back. Because to me, like, a lot of people think that they can just hammer out stuff into, into this void or echo chamber, um, and they think there's no consequence, you know? So yeah. I love it when he comes back because it shows people, it, you know, it shows, it makes you think twice, right? Because to me, I think if you, if it's, if it's something you're not going to say to someone's face, then you shouldn't say it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, so to me, I think that, um, I, yeah, I respect that side of him. I respect that creative drive and that, that business edge that he has. Uh, and as, and again, like I think in, in some ways, um, him being, brave enough to run Wembley Stadium has given me the confidence to have my own mini gamble in terms of running the copper box um, because that kind of stuff's inspiring when you surround yourself I'm not saying like I surround myself as Tony Khan one of my top five um, yeah. but I mean if he wants to be my bestie then hey do you know what I mean he'll be in London for a few days this weekend we can hang out um, but uh, you know it's important to surround yourself by positive thinkers 
and mm. people who can motivate you. And I think that you can spend so long being around people who are negative about everything that it can kind of, uh, it can bring you down. Yeah. But when you see him having that gung-ho forward attitude, um, it's inspiring. And that's kind of, again, that inspires me, it pushes me, it makes me want to be better. It makes me want to make Revolution Pro Wrestling be better. Um, and that's kind of been my my covert goal with um, with this weekend to try and produce the best wrestling show of the weekend, you know, and I, I've, I've, you know, I've said we can't compete with that stage, but I think there's a lot of other areas where we can compete. What's it been like the the times that you've done a bit of business, like when Pat had the international title and, and I remember I was at a show where like Kip Sabian was there and he like attacked Pac and kind of like what was that like and did you kind of expect them to use the international title more overseas or can you see them doing that more in the future um to be honest I look I would have loved to have continued to do stuff with the international title and I still would love to do more stuff with the international title because I feel like you know it's it's been given that name for a reason um and I think that it's it's unique because obviously it helps add the credibility to that championship as a world championship a real a real international title um so it helps in that respect in adding that credibility it helps us in um adding a legitimacy to our professional wrestling shows to the wider audience because again i was kind of surprised with you know look i guess aew is a startup brand right Mm -hmm. and i was kind of surprised um by how many casual fans um and when i say casual fans because you kind of expect quote unquote smart fans to kind of have a some kind of idea of what a revolution pro wrestling is right but um but yeah the aew just opens the net even wider and that creates a lot of possibilities and that's again an example of what we're hoping to create this weekend so the fact that they they were willing to work with us in that respect anyway was it was a huge honor um but it was great because it added new eyeballs onto our product it added new eyeballs onto our wrestlers um and it created some new fans um Mm -hmm. and that's what we try to do and that's what we always try to do um and the fact that not only that you know so not only so just for example when we did the we did a cruiserweight classic match for wwe back in the day um and we did that match and there were highlights on whatever right and but it was very much a hidden thing on the wwe.com and you know and they put the highlights up afterwards and you know credit revolution pro wrestling but aw were actively on their social media saying Pax competing at this show you yeah. know um and that's what I thought was so cool about it you know the, the way that they actively want to help because I think and again it may be Tony's sports background um but he recognizes the need for grassroots um yeah. because it's impossible you've got to have a pipeline of development if you don't have that pipeline then ultimately you're going to run out of talent or you're going to have a talent roster which will grow old and stale mm-hmm. so um so yeah so I think he recognizes that need for that that grassroots professional wrestling rather than see it as you know look I I think I don't want to get in trouble but I think WWE look at it and be like wrestling although we don't want to call it wrestling sports entertainment anything resembling sports entertainment belongs to us and it's almost like they're kind of offended that we want a few crumbs off their birthday cake you know um whereas I think AEW is a lot more open to, to there being a world outside their world. Um, I guess that's, again, like I say, just that more legitimate sports background. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it was great. Absolutely great working with them. And, you know, it, from my mind, it's just, you look at AEW, there's so much stuff going on. Um, there's so many different, um, you know, like, look, they had the video game, they launching Collision, um, you know, I'm sure there's a, you know, there's talk of like a net, you know, a, a streaming service. There's, you know, um, talk of them upping the number of pay-per-views they run. Um, you know, there's so much stuff that they have going on constantly. You know, they did that reality show, right? Yeah. And when you think about British professional wrestling, when you think about independent professional wrestling, we're very low, probably on the priority list. Right. And that's understandable when you've got so many masters to serve. Um, So I understand that, you know, it's not it's not something which has been pushed through more. Right. Because it's a it's a I guess for them, it's a it's a nice to have luxury. Right. It's not a necessity. 
and it doesn't drive their business really aside from um i guess uh creating a more loyal and hardcore fan base mm -hmm. in the uk and i think that as new japan pro wrestling have proven having that loyal hardcore fan base that's the people that are going to spend a lot of money and they're going to be a lot more invested um and you know and they, they're going to feel more connected to the product and that's the type of connection that you can only get inside independent professional wrestling small intimate venues where mm. you feel up close and personal to the action and i think that everyone felt when when pack did those matches when stuff aired like even there's a couple of um lance archer wrestled for us recently um, and they put some of the highlights just on a a little um thing that they did uh you know to hype up lance archer going for the international title um but little things like that they just help to uh to bring closer people closer to the product and, and feel closer to the product and then you know then because they then become more loyal, they're then going to spend more money, stay connected for longer, and be more passionate and tell their friends about it. I always say one fan at a time. It's very much that kind of principle. AW, like they really do, you know, as you said, they see more than just themselves. They see like internationally and like so many great wrestlers from the past became great through traveling and working in different places. Um, do you feel like or have you encountered people that have been in the WWE system, whether it's in NXT or NXT UK, that have come out and almost needed to be deprogrammed or something because they went into Young and didn't get that experience? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So like I'd, I'd even say, for example, when Pac came out of the, the WWE system, he yeah. had to readjust to life on the indies so to speak and if you watch Pac's first few matches back like look Pac's world class it took him you know a matter of a handful of matches but if you watch Pac's first matches back out of WWE and you've got to bear in mind he also had that year off as well yeah. but like if you watch his first matches back compared to more recent matches you'll see that is is a completely different animal you know um but I do think there is definitely that element of um of um almost deprogramming the 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 wrestling it's very um cookie cutter style wrestling that wwe often do um and i think that that's one of the issues with wwe or has been one of the issues because look if you look at the people who've been most successful in terms of new names in the last what five six years you've got to look at someone like an aj styles right what's aj styles done he never went through the nxt system yeah he traveled around the world and he came in as a star now look at the most recent example, Cody Rhodes, right? Cody from before to Cody now is night and day. Mm -hmm. And that's because Cody traveled the world, became a superstar, learned the business. Like he knew the business, don't get me wrong. He learned another side of the business. Yeah. He knew the tricks of the business that you can only pick up by working different size buildings, different levels of opponent, you know, different styles of opponent and not doing the same thing night in, night out. I always find it crazy. Like, I understand why they do it, but I always find it crazy when um, WWE, when they run house shows and they just run the same house show night after night yeah. after night. Because to me, I'd get bored doing the same thing night after night after night. Um, and I think we live in a day and age now when I think there's a lot of fans that would follow shows from town to town, especially, for example, when they do a UK tour, but they don't because they know it's the same thing night after night. Um, but also for workers' development, to be working different opponents every night would probably be a lot more beneficial to their their progression than working the same opponent every night. So yeah. um, so absolutely, I think that there's, um, you know, look, WWE teaches different things. WWE can can teach star presence, you know, like a, a lot of places can't, you know, because it's they create WWE create larger than life superstars and teach people how to carry themselves, you know. Um, so there's importance of learning from every place. I wouldn't dismiss a single place. Um, but I think that if you were to to dismiss the role that independent professional wrestling has, and if you were to dismiss um the importance 
um, of the independent scene, then you're doing yourself and you're doing your product a huge disservice. Let's get into some of the matches that you have coming up um, for this show on Saturday. Uh, we have Shibata teaming with El Fantasmo against M. Finley and Gabriel Kidd. So did you ever think you'd have the chance of booking Shibata? And kind of what was that like getting him on the card? Um, so no, I, I really, obviously, I, I think that if you'd asked a, a couple of years ago if if anyone thought that he'd be back in a wrestling ring, the answer would probably have been a no. Um, but I Shabbat is, is a funny one because Shabbat, when he first, um, when I first booked him for Revolution Pro Wrestling, he was almost one of the the wrestlers that I was un- unable to get hold of from New Japan. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was at the time he he was a, a freelancer um, and wasn't contracted to New Japan, and then. When he he got contracted to New Japan, we were able to bring him to to the UK. And not only were we able to bring him to the UK, we were able to have him as the undisputed British heavyweight champion for a period of time, which for me was a huge thrill because um, Shibata's style of um, professional wrestling is uh, is very unique. Um, And he's someone who I think just brings legitimacy to to anyone who's watching, you know, Um, he looks like a movie star. Um, He's just, he wrestles like an absolute badass. Um, And his matches, they bring something that nothing else, that no, is is just a style that no one else brings to the table, you know? Um, So he's just such a, a unique wrestler. And when you look at him, he's not, He's not what you'd call a, a traditional star when you look at him, um, but I think that's what it takes. You know, it takes something from out the box to be to be a star. You know, um, and yeah, it's a huge thrill to be able to have him back. And of course, when he started to get back into the ring, that's where it felt like oh, maybe maybe we could do something. Um, and then obviously, um, he was still present in Revolution Pro Wrestling, even in his time outside the ring. Um, the last time we saw him was in June of 2019. Oh, he was at Royal Quest as well in August. Um, he actually did a seminar at our Portsmouth School of Wrestling then as well. Um, but in June of 2019, he was on one of our shows. Um, and that's where he selected Gabriel Kidd to take him to the LA Dojo. So, um, you know, even though we're bringing in outside guests and Shabata absolutely will count as an outside guest, Um He's very much a part of a Rev Pro fabric. He's very much a part of a Rev Pro history. Um, so it seems very fitting that he's a part of our anniversary show. So um, just a huge thrill to be able to see him again, to have him back in the ring again. I think he's very excited. Um, he loves England. He loves reception from from the you know the crowds um, that he used to get. Um, and I think that you know he's going to bring that energy uh, this Saturday. Um, and of course, when we talk about kind of imports. You know, um, El Fantasmo is one of those guys who really made a name for himself in Revolution Pro Wrestling. Um, he took a chance on himself. He moved over to the UK for two years. Um, and he went from someone who was an unknown um, to someone that became a legitimate superstar. You know, he's another one of these wrestlers who was able to make a unique connection with the people. And anyone who's there for that period of time that Fantasmo was there will know that he was a real superstar, you know. Um and I'm very excited to be welcoming ELP back as well. He was never intended to be gone for this long. Um, pandemic got in the way. Um, he's He was with us the week before the pandemic hit. He was actually in the UK with us. Um, I remember watching him at the show um, in the cockpit. Was he on that yeah. one? Just yeah, and he was on. He was on our very last show before the. Um, so he did the. You see, I think he was, he was in England for three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, he did cockpit. Um, he had a St. Neat show, maybe. Um, but yeah, he was he was there for a while. Um, well, I would say a while. He did a few shows, and yeah. then uh, yeah, then he went back, and it was almost like, "Oh, we'll see you in a couple of months," type thing. And yeah, literally, I think it was two weeks later, everything officially shut down. Yeah. So yeah, just a crazy, crazy time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be great to welcome El Fantasmo back. Um, and it, it was what's great is, you know, it's been so long since I've seen him, but I'm sure it'll be like, we've you know, he's never left, you know, from the moment he, he kind of gets to the UK. Um, so that's great. And then obviously you've got the War do- Dogs, the Bullet Club War Dogs. You've got um, Finley, who I actually think this might be Finley's first time. He may have done some stuff for Brian Dixon, um, uh, 
uh, in the past. But this, I think, is his first, I guess, mainstream trip to the UK. Um, I don't think he was on any of the royal quests. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely his first time for Revolution Pro Wrestling anyway. So that's pretty cool. Um, and the fact that he's, he's essentially taken the mantle of Jay White, um in his absence um and of course jay white was obviously someone who was very familiar to to revolution pro wrestling crowds so it's great to have finley here and of course gabriel kidd who for me for revolution pro wrestling has been one out one of the standout performers um you know and and i think he's one of he was one of the standout performers in my opinion of a g1 as well um so you know i think I'm predicting big things for Gabe, but like, uh, yeah, as, as often as we can get him in the fold, um, we, we we will have him here and we welcome him with open arms. Um, and it's just, just an exciting, unpredictable match. And I think when I announced it, I said, there's never been a match which has elicited so many swear words. Yeah. And I think it's one of those matches that you can say it out loud, but then when you look at it on paper, you're like, whoa, you know, like, I need to see this. And this is a, a match which is going to bring a bit of intrigue. Um, it, you know, it's it's a very Rev Pro type match. Um, it's entrenched in our history. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for that contest. And that's a type of match which will garner attention from the entire wrestling world. Um, and then hopefully... You know, again, it's a, it's a trend you'll probably see as we go through, but hopefully, you know, people will come for that match and stay for, you know, some of the stars of Revolution Pro Wrestling or come back for the, the stars of Revolution Pro Wrestling who are there week in, week out. You also have Mickey James coming over for a triple threat with, with Hyen and Alex Windsor. Um, what's it been like for you with Mickey being probably the biggest female import you've brought in? Like, how have you seen that affect things? And also just given... Hyen and Alex, the chance to work with someone that I'm sure they both grew up watching and, and idolizing. Yeah, I think I think that's very important. And I think that it's easy. So I, I've, I've said I've done so many interviews in the lead up to this thing. Um, I don't know who I said it to, but I was I was saying in comparison. So, for example, a Will Ospreay, when Will Ospreay was coming through, he's had the opportunity to work with Okada, to work with um, Ricochet, um, AJ Styles, Matt Seidel, you know, really a, a who's who of professional wrestling. And he's able to um, learn so many valuable lessons um, from wrestling those guys, which has helped him in his progression, which has then in turn helped him become the best wrestler in the world. Um, and I think that um, one of the things about the women's division is a, is a very much a, a developing division um, in the sense as there's, there's obviously not as much depth, but that's a natural thing. And as obviously as time goes on, there'll become more depth um, and a big part of their becoming more depth. So first of all, is someone like Mickey James in the first place, who mm -hmm. alongside, for example, Trish Stratus, I think was one of the real pioneers of, she was one of the first women to, um, you know, in, in, in recent times, one of the first women to kind of go out there and have those banger matches, you yeah. know, to have real wrestling matches and, and it not be all about, the, you know, the, the, the bikini models and the, you know, mm -hmm. the gimmicks and whatever have you. Um, and so people like Mickey James, and you're right to say that Hi Anna and Alex Windsor will have grown up idolizing her because it's people like that who then empower people to get into the into the wrestling business in the first place. Yeah. And obviously, if Mickey James is responsible for getting uh, you know a sea of professional wrestlers involved into the business then there's going to be a knock-on effect because then now, for example, if you look at the, the women who are, uh, you know, competing mainstream now, there's a, there's a lot more than there's ever been. Yeah. And that, that pool of talent is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And a big part of that, but it is a process that you have to be patient with, but a big part of that is now someone like Mickey James is able to share that knowledge, share that experience with Alex Windsor and Hyann. And Hyann and Alex Windsor are then going to be able to share any lessons they learned from Mickey mm -hmm. with their future opponents. So yeah. she's still giving back to the business and ensuring, almost safeguarding its future. And I just think it's so cool that we've been able to bring her in um, for, for, for this occasion because, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's almost not fair that we've got some very talented women and it's almost not fair that they haven't got 
as many as many women or many world class, world traveled women to work with. Um, so to be able to do that with Mickey James, I think it's for me, it's a real honor. And I'm sure it's going to be the same for Alex Windsor and Hyann. Um, and uh, and she is she's a legitimate superstar. And yeah. I'm I'm very excited to bring her in. And, and, and you know, this is one of those cards where I just want up and down the card. There's no weak links there's no um there's no point in the cards where you're like oh you know debating whether this should be on a card you know i use the term all the time all killer and no filler um and, and this is just an example of that up and down the card um and uh yeah as as, as well as great in-ring ability uh, mickey james also brings star power and presence um which hopefully will help add to the occasion um, yeah and I, I spoke earlier you know when we're talking about wwe about that star power, what you kind of learn, that that presence, you know, how to be a larger than life star. And that's another thing that Mickey James is going to bring to the table. So yeah, I for me, the the perfect addition to the show. Mm -hmm. You have a big match between Will Ospreay and Shingo. Um, why why did you choose Shingo as the guy for Ospreay on, on this stage? Um, so I look to me, I think it's important. The importance of build is very important. And I wanted to have a card. So if you look up and down the card, there has been so even the Mickey James match. Um, there has been build to it, even though she's not been involved in it. Her um, I guess her presence is enough to to bring her into the story. Um, yeah. But um, up and down the card, I want to have build. So we announced this show, I think, three months ago. Um, maybe two, two and a half, three months ago, something like that. But when we announced the card, what I wanted to be able to do was come in with a big match, which gave us a sign of intent to let people know, hey, we're not messing around here, you know, we're the real deal. Because there's lots of shows going on this weekend um, yeah. outside of AEW. And we're competing with a lot of other wrestling promotions for the, for the fans' money. And we know times are hard. We know everyone's got limited resources in this time. So that's why it's so... You know, it's real humbling when people spend their money on our product and and put faith in our product. But at the end of the day, we're putting on a premium event. And I didn't want to go in there with our premium event, our premium event pricing and not let people know what they're expecting. Because the very nature of stories is you have to let them breathe and you have to let them evolve over time. And we run a lot of professional wrestling shows. Yeah. So um so again like just as a just for example um i was looking at um our schedule and progress's schedule i guess we could probably if you were to look at us as um you know the the two i guess leading um premium based wrestling products in the uk um mm -hmm. i'd say like and again i i don't mean that to belittle anyone else's product um uh, maybe the two most well known might be fair yeah. to say mm -hmm. um but between Progress's last show and this show, our shows are obviously at the same time. Between their last show and this show, Revolution Pro Wrestling's run ten events. Yeah, up in the country. So, so it necessitates telling stories over a period of time. Um, so I think that that's that's very important. It's very important not for, it was very important for me not to just throw out a series of dream matches because there's all kinds of discussions about what this show could be, right? It could just be an exhibition show of, of dream matches, so to speak. But to me, I wanted it to stay true and it would have been an easier win for me. Yeah. Right. But like, for me, I wanted to stay true to Revolution Pro Wrestling. I wanted to stay true to what brought us to the dance. Um, and I wanted to uh, really focus and highlight what we're all about so people know that so this is what you can expect on a week-to-week -week basis these are the stars you can expect to see on a week-to-week -week basis and i wanted to give as many of our roster the opportunity to perform on that stage as well um but we had to start somewhere and we had to let people know the, the caliber of what they were getting so it doesn't get much bigger and it doesn't get much better than shingo takagi and will osprey they mm -hmm. fought to critical acclaim to me it's one of those rivalries which is going to go down as an all-time legendary rival rivalry um you can put whatever weight you want behind dave Meltzer's star ratings they garner attention and yeah. it is just one man's opinion but it's one man who's watched a lot of a lot of professional wrestling five matches and lowest rating one's got is five star rating and for me every time i watch well look well, every time i watch will osprey he always he never ceases to amaze me um but 
there's something about Shingo and Osprey. They just bring the best out of each other. Yeah. Like I love Shingo's style as well, you know. And to me, there's not a better match. We use we we, we use the term pro wrestling at its best all the time. So if you were to try and personify pro wrestling at its best, what is pro wrestling at its best in in human form? It's Shingo Takagi versus Will Ospreay, you know, and that's the type of match. Um, we at our show Epic Encounter, um, which we run, um, it's an annual show which turned into a two regular show during the pandemic. But like we have an Epic Encounter show, which is obviously based around an Epic Encounter or several Epic Encounters. Mm -hmm. But like for years, um, the one that stands to mind, obviously, like Keith Lee uh, versus Tomohiro Ishii, as the epic encounter you know yeah. um and i feel like this is very much akin to that the epic encounter you have that big match um like a i don't know i mean you can use ishii again but hero and ishii or um shibata and riddle or, or you know um angle versus saber those super fights right that just uh they 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 kind of get the whole they they just amass this whole kind of interest based around the uniqueness of the professional wrestling match, the excitement behind it, what people are about to witness, and it draws people into the building. And then of course our aim and everyone else is on the card aim is to have them going away talking about something other than the main event. And don't get me wrong, that main event's going to be fantastic, but everyone else is you know going to be working their socks off to try and match that you know, and, and and try and steal the weekend. That's the thing we were talking about earlier. Competition breeding success, you know, iron sharpens iron, everyone jockeying to be number one. And uh, and that's exactly what this match is going to do. Um, I think it's very befitting of Revolution Pro Wrestling um, and what we've done throughout our years. Um, and of course, you, we couldn't have had an anniversary show on this stage without Will Ospreay because he has been such a huge part in our history. Um, just... Look, you've seen him grow up before your very eyes. Um, you know, he was a child when he started wrestling for us. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously it was in Revolution Pro Wrestling where he had his match with Okada, which then opened the door to New Japan Pro Wrestling. When he came back from Best of the Super Juniors, he received that homecoming. Like, people have been there for that journey. And now Will Ospreay's in a position where he stands the best wrestler in the world. and doesn't need to be here he doesn't need to compete for revolution pro wrestling he earns enough money he's you know he could do with a time off right but he's here because he wants to be here mm -hmm. and he's so one of the people that's again pushing me he's, he's one of the people who says you know just do it just go yeah. for it you know um and it's again the type of people you want to be around you because He's always, and you know, you, you, it's impossible unless you've got a drive and a passion like no other for this business. It's impossible to achieve the level that Will Ospreay's been able to achieve in the ring, and that drive rubs off on you. And just look at the the wrestlers, you know, who've improved through working Will Ospreay, mm -hmm. and look at the wrestlers whose best match is against Will Ospreay. You know. Um, the lessons he's been able to teach people in the ring, you know, again, give him back, give him back, you know, at the start, you know, it, I think what I find most crazy is at the start, it's like we were bringing imports in to wrestle him, yeah. to help in his progression, to help put eyeballs on him. But now he's in the position of that import. And I think that's great. And I look forward to seeing, you know, the guys he's worked with, the guys he's helped bring up. I look forward to that time when those guys are in Will Ospreay's position right now as well. Mm -hmm. Because the natural effect is people are just getting better and better and better. So, you know, it's scary to think how good these shows are going to be. You know, I say it time and time again, the depth on our roster right now is deeper than it's ever been. So um, it's scary to think where it's going to wind up. Osprey is, he's doing like double duty at the weekend and wrestling at Wembley the next night. Um, it will show the next day. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Do, does him being booked on that card, does that change anything for you or give you anything you have to take into consideration when you're using him or? Uh, no, Will was, Will no. was going to win, wasn't he? Like there's no, there's no, no holding back Will Osprey. He's, uh, yeah, he's another animal, you know, um, and um 
I guess he's used to it, you know, G the G1 climax, you know, I know obviously this last couple of years have been spaced out a lot more um, in terms of those singles matches, but he's used to those big matches night in, night out. Um, so, you know, um, I feel like uh, it's, if anything, it's kind of made the whole thing more exciting because it's put yeah. more... It's put more attention on Will, which in turn then puts more attention on us. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's great. I'm very excited to Will, to, to see Will Ospreay versus Chris Jericho as well. I think uh, it's a uh, look. It's a, to me, it's a stylistically intriguing contest. I think that it's one of those matches. Um, the obvious answer, of course, for everyone, who do you want to see Will Ospreay wrestle on uh, at Wembley Stadium? The obvious answer is Kenny Omega. Hmm. But I'm telling you. <laughs> I think Will Ospreay and Chris Jericho is going to be a very, very special match because Chris Jericho is one of these guys as well who um, he's motivated. And again, this is, I don't know Chris Jericho personally, but just from, from watching him from afar, Chris Jericho for me seems to be someone who's, who's motivated improving his doubters wrong. Mm -hmm. He's someone who's motivated in consistently um, reinventing himself. And the second that people write him off, boom, he's back. You know, and I think that this is another one of those opportunities for Chris Jericho to prove his doubters wrong and almost have just what another crowning moment on this illustrious career. And I can't think of anyone for him better to do it against than Will Ospreay. So, um, listen, I think that this match, to me, it's, it, and I, I say this as a compliment, it's interesting, it's fresh, you know, it's a first time matchup. Um, and I think it's going to be one of the matches of the weekend. Um, after a few matches from the copper box yeah oh we talked about you know that there might be fans here that have maybe never heard of WebPro before that are going because you know, they're in town to see more wrestling who are some of the wrestlers on this card that given those eyes might be on it that you absolutely had to put on there to expose them to more people that you think people walk away thinking about um, well, obviously, there's our, our undisputed British heavyweight champion, Michael Oku, who's starting mm. to make waves for himself. Of course, he was yeah. in the Chris Jericho at PWG at the top of the year. Yeah. Um, obviously, Michael Oku is someone who um, he's, I don't know how to describe him, but he's, 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 he's not your traditional heavyweight, of course, if you just look yeah. at him, right? But he is someone who tells stories in the ring. He's one of the most compelling wrestlers I've, I've ever seen. And he's someone who... Um, for me, like, look, I, I watched him compete in Portsmouth Guild Hall last night against Levi Muir, um, and it's the best, for, for my money, the best match I've ever seen Levi have. And, and I watched I watched that match, and I was like, wow, Levi's going to be a superstar, and that's based off of him wrestling Michael Oku. You know, um, I think a personal goal for him may well be to have that reputation of being the same as Will, you know, in terms of everyone has their best matches with Michael. Right. And I think that he's not again, he's not a flashy wrestler, but he's a wrestler that will make you believe. And that's the type of wrestler that you want. When he won the championship, grown men and women were jumping up and down and hugging each other. They know they know it's a work. Right. But people are able to suspend their disbelief. And that's what it's all about. You know, we, we want people to, to suspend their disbelief when they come to see our performances. You know, this is an immersive experience. You allow yourself to get lost. You allow yourself to go on a journey. And I promise you, you'll have the time of your life. And Michael Oku's matches, you know, that's what they do. They take you on a journey. So he's someone you have to go out your way to see. And you have to go out your way to, to seek more of him. He's going to be competing against Trent Seven, who's a guy that um, a lot of people will know from his time in NXT and NXT UK. Um, if I think about other guys, Luke Jacobs, to me, um, is a guy that you have to go out your way to see. Um, he's competing against Tomohiro Ishii. Um, he's, uh, I guess, his Japanese father. You know, if, it, yeah. you, you know, if, they, if they were you know if they looked alike and came from the same came from the same town you know you you would think that they were related somehow you know um because they're like a dream match for each other you know they just the way they wrestle they're like a mirror match and luke jacobs is a consistently evolving student of the game he's a hard hitter but he's also got speed he's got intensity um no one is able to uh, hit combinations of maneuvers, high impact maneuvers like Luke Jacobs. Um, his acceleration, 
the way he goes through the gears is second to none. Um, and, you know, he's someone that I, you know, I, you have to go out your way to see. And again, what I'm hoping is people watch these matches of a Michael Oger, of a Luke Jacobs, and mm -hmm. then they're like, we need to see more. And there's a whole back catalogue of it on RevProOnDemand.com where you can see them wrestle against world-class competition. Um, I guess guys like Leon Slater is another one, you know, 18 years old, phenom, like just crazy crazy ability capable of doing stuff which is looks like it is come from a video game you mm -hmm. know um if you didn't see it with your own eyes you wouldn't believe it if someone explained it to you you wouldn't believe it um but he's in a he's in a contest with dan maloney and it's going to be a chance to see another side of leon slater this is not a uh is, this is a very uh heated and emotionally fueled contest he's going to have with dan maloney who's someone he's kind of looked up to as a mentor who turned his back on him so we're going to see another side of leon slater and i think that's very important in his development as well because he can't just be a human highlight reel mm -hmm. you know and i'm excited about seeing him in front of that crowd seeing how he responds to the challenge because each and every time he's in front of the crowd it's pretty crazy like you think that um you think that when i don't know someone so young you don't expect to rise to the occasion like he does yeah, uh, and he wrestled Will Ospreay at the last York Hall show, and he was there every step of the way, unfazed, water off a duck's back. It comes so natural to him. It comes so easy to him, and not just that, he's a nice guy as well. It's insane. It's very rare you get that combination. Um, but uh, yeah, Leon Slater, obviously, have to see him. Um, look, I could go up and down the whole cards, but. Um, <laughs> But that you know, those are those are probably my free uh, ones to watch. Um, but like I say, that there, there's many, many more, literally up and down the card. But like I said, the depth we have is absolutely insane. Yeah, you have those great young names that people haven't been exposed to uh, much. And you talked before about like the rise and growth of Osprey within RevPro, and now he's going all the way to Wembley with everything that he's done. Um, what's it like um, mentally being someone that nurtures these stars, knowing that they're going to like pass on to like an American company or like a, a new Japan? Like, how do you have to kind of like reckon with that and make sure you keep the business going? Um, so first of all, like I, I always, always want people to achieve whatever it is they've set out for. So some guys will come to me and say, hey, I, I want to try and get in WWE. Mm -hmm. Other guys will say to me, you get the liars. I just, I just want to be here in Rev Pro. That's all I'm interested in. I just want Rev Pro to grow. I've got no interest in WWE, AEW, New Japan. I just want Rev Pro's where it's at. And if I go anywhere, I want to go somewhere where I can work for Rev Pro still. And then you know, it's those people, are the, the, the talkers are the ones that you know the second that an offer comes. They're like, see you later, mate. Yeah. Right? Um, and I've had that many times in the past, and I'm sure I'll have it many times in the future. Um, but it, it, there's no hard feelings to that at all. Um, you know, I want people to achieve um, their potential. I want people to fulfill their potential because I'm not stupid. I know that if someone comes um, from Rev Pro and becomes a big name somewhere else, then their new legion of fans are going to you know want to find out more about them and naturally that leads them back to rev pro and then naturally that gives us another opportunity to create new fans so i love that knock-on effect and that's great you know um but in terms of um you know and, and for me personally as well like all i ever want from this i i i've spoken a lot about this recently um and it's because i'm getting old and i did my life perspective has changed and things have happened in my life that made me think differently about just life in general right but like i'm all about legacy now right and i want to be able to leave something behind um i want people to remember me for having a positive impact yeah. upon not just professional wrestling but wrestling in general um i don't just want you know i want people to know my name like i don't want to be the center of attention yeah just like a bit of credit for um essentially dedicating my entire life to this profession mm -hmm. um and you know i'm gonna nick a line from beyond the mat so being unselfish in selfish times but yeah but you know what i mean like i 
look, I've sacrificed everything for this business. And like everyone always says to me, like, if, if you dedicated this much time, put this much energy, this much passion into anything other than professional wrestling, you'll be yeah. a millionaire right now. And and honestly, because I, I look, I don't disagree with them, but I don't think I'd be able to put in the drive, effort, passion mm -hmm. into any other industry because professional wrestling's got my heart. So, you know, I don't... Yeah. Um, I'm not bitter about wrestling for costing me my mansion, you know. Um, no, I I hear that like all the all the time from people like in my family. Like if you know if you work this hard at something that I, wasn't wrestling, you could get a like I don't know Pulitzer or something. I'm like, yeah, but I probably wouldn't be happy or I wouldn't be able to do that. It's that's just, it, and you have to you have to put yourself you have to put it into perspective all the time. And yeah. I always I, I don't even remember what the original question was, so we deviated here. But like, I always I always say. Um, you know, when times get hard, I like if you look at my Twitter, there's a little picture of little Andy, really cute, playing with his WWF yeah. action, right? And the reason I tagged that on my Twitter is not just because I look really cute as a kid, right? But because it's a reminder to myself and on Twitter specifically, where yeah. people are horrible, right? Mm -hmm. I look at that picture and I'm like, if you could have told that young boy that he would have done all the stuff that I've done, how would he feel, you know? Yeah. And when you remember you're a fan, in those just crap times that you experience in this business, if you remember that first and foremost, you're a fan of professional wrestling, how lucky and privileged you are to be in this position, um, you know, then it just makes everything a lot easier to bear. So, you know, so, so for me, like I say, it's, it's about legacy um, as well. I want people... You know, I, I, I do, I want to be remembered as someone who, who's put that, you know, positive, like put the needs of others before the needs of himself yeah. and has um, has made a positive splash on the business. Um, so, and I think that a big part of that is obviously, um, you know, the guys, I was getting us back on track here, the guys that, you know, who go on to bigger and better things to be able to acknowledge you. So it's always nice when you get that acknowledgement. Um, so that's why it's so, for me, when you hear, for example, when you hear Will Ospreay like um, name check Rev Pro at the press conference, and then yeah. Tony Khan specifically name checks myself, you know, and you hear that, that's like, oh wow, you know, like, you know, it's it's it makes it kind of feel worthwhile. It's not mm -hmm. a financial thing; it's literally something. You know, I'd love my son to be able to um, Google my name and and be proud of what I've accomplished, you know. Um, and I and like I say, just that positive contribution to this business which honestly the shows i used to go and watch when i was a child were so terrible right and i was just this wrestling fan i was madly in love with this sport and i used to convince myself they were good because there was nothing else yeah. and, and it all do you know like i just i just want to be around a wrestling ring i just want to be able to shout i just want to lose myself for two hours right so if i can progress that and, and make all the little the little andies of this generation feel something then for me it means something Mm -hmm. um and you know and and i feel like so there's so there's that aspect of it in terms of bringing people through and also um to prepare for it ensuring we've got a conveyor belt of talent going all the time you yeah. know i think that that's very important as well like the i i have a big and i think that i look i'm going to say um since just probably just before the pandemic um I feel like uh, I'm better at it now. I think during the pandemic, I had a lot of time to think during the pandemic, mm -hmm. right, about how I would do things differently in terms of bringing talent through. Um, obviously, we've got our Portsmouth School of Wrestling, we've got our London School of Wrestling, we've developed some fantastic professional wrestlers across the, across the years. But again, by its very nature, learning from our mistakes, learning from our successes, um, you know, this next crop of talent coming through are better than they've ever been um, and more exciting than before. Um, than ever before um, but also I kind of you know I, again I started taking risks with young talent just before the pandemic but since the pandemic I've been taking a lot more risks with young talent so what I mean by that is there's a lot of established talent on the shows who can sell tickets and again no one can sell tickets in a great degree look there's a few people who make a difference to ticket sales like for example, Will Ospreay is a is a difference maker, but no one by the by, by and by, no one's really a difference maker, which makes a, the business so hard. You know, I said about wrestlers being worth more than they're paid. 
but no one's a difference maker at the moment. We're trying to change that, actively trying to change that. But, you know, but from the perception of a show, you've got the established guy that you know the name of, or you've got the young rookie that people don't know. What's a safer bet as well? The safer bet is the established guy, you know, the established guy that you know, if they slip up, they're not going to panic. They're not going to be like a deer in headlights. They're going to be able to safely um, continue the match and get through and whatever have you. That's a safe bet. Um, but if you play it safe all the time, you're never going to, you know, you, you risk nothing, you risk everything type thing, right? You're never going to achieve anything. So we have to take risks on talent that people don't know. We have to be stubborn and continue to utilize that talent, even though, because when naturally when people aren't familiar with a talent, they don't have give the same reaction to that talent, right? But it's up to the talent to do the talking, right? It's easy. And, they, look, and what I'm saying is I'm not talking about people like Leon Slater. It's easy to say, oh, look, Leon Slater, you know, he's like, we give young talent a go, look at Leon Slater. Leon Slater's the exception to a rule, mm -hmm. right? It's easy to work with the exception to the rule. But I'm talking about the development, the actual development of talent, right? Where you take those risks and you know they're going to make mistakes. And you know that if you put someone else in that position, the match may be a little bit better, right? But that helps you today. It doesn't help you tomorrow. It mm -hmm. doesn't help you next year or the year after that. And it's so important that, you know, every now and again, we we suffer for uh, because we've put, you know, someone young, inexperienced, et cetera, in those positions, because we need to, to, to develop them so they learn from their mistakes so they're ready. So they're ready when the next guy goes off to Japan, goes off to America, goes off to Mexico or wherever it may be, you know. Um, and, uh, and that's just all part of the process, you know. And um, I feel that I'm a lot more measured um, than I ever was before. I'm a lot less reactionary than I ever was before. And I've learned the hard way that I need to trust my instincts a lot more. Like, cause I, I can, you know, I can easily be swayed by other people's opinions. Yeah. Um, and there's been so many times with the benefit of hindsight, being like, I wish I just trusted my instincts. And that's what I'm learning to do as we go on. And again, it's, it's for me, it's a process as well. You know, I've, I've been doing this for a long time now and I still make mistakes and, I'm not perfect, but it's about learning from each other's mistakes and becoming that little bit more dangerous next time, right? And um, yeah, I think, and that's kind of led us to where we are now with this just incredible, incredible level of depth. And there's other talents as well, absolutely, des absolutely deserving to be on the show who aren't on this show, but we need it to be a success because we need to make sure there's another one of these shows for the guys and girls who are coming through right now, you yeah. know? So yeah, it's like I say, like it's, it's an exciting time and, and yeah, I'm not, I don't sweat when it comes to, um, you know, talent going elsewhere. We will always create more talent because we've got foresight and mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. Don't ever want to find ourselves in a position whereby, you know, everyone's off, like, you know, like an NXT UK type scenario, yeah. everyone's off can't use anyone and then you've got no backbone you know you've got no foundation so we're we're always building we're always looking towards a future well andy it's been really great getting to talk to you again uh why don't you give us like one last you know hard sell of why we should be spending our saturday at the copper box with rev pro and also let us know about like tickets or or how to watch if you can't get down there well if you're going to be in london and you're a professional wrestling fan, what else are you going to do? There you go. Yeah. That's my hard sell. But realistically, these are the best wrestlers in the world. And I mean it. Even the Rev Pro guys, the UK-based talent that you may not be familiar with, they are on the level with the best wrestlers in the world. They are young. They're hungry. They're at the top of their game. This, for many, many people on this show, is going to be the biggest show they've ever done. This, for many people on the show, is a very, very special night for them. They know the eyes of the wrestling world are on them, and they're all looking to steal this weekend of professional wrestling. So, you know, it's, it's a huge motivator for everyone. They're so excited, and that's going to create 
this environment, which is so, so special. And not just that, the UK fans as well are special and are going to be excited and are going to be in party atmosphere, party mode, because this is a very special week for UK professional wrestling fans. I don't think the significance of this week for UK wrestling fans has been, uh, is clear enough for a worldwide wrestling audience. This is a moment we've been crying out for since 1992. I want to see um, event centres with fans from the UK. I want to see the new British Bulldog girl. It's a girl. We <laughs> thought it was a boy for many years, but it's a girl. Yeah. You know, the British Bulldog's going to win if he wants to or not. You know, I want to see the 2023 version of that. I, The whole of the UK is so pumped about this weekend and I think that they want to prove a point they want to prove a point that we deserve this this has been owed to us for a very long time um and and my mindset with this with our show is we want to add we want to add to that weekend we don't want to take away we don't want to say come to us don't go there we want to add to that celebration we want to add to that party spirit um and we want to be something that has helped made All In Weekend a destination for wrestling fans around the globe. We want people to see what happens this weekend and say, if there's another one, we have to travel across the world to be there. You know, and with that mindset, this makes this show can't miss, let alone the fact that on paper, every single one of these matches is an absolute banger guaranteed. So... You add all those elements. How can you afford to miss this show? And then the fact that it's our 11 year anniversary show, 11 years to the day, not even, this isn't a kayfabe date, 26th of August, 2012, I stood in the ring and said, we are Revolution Pro Wrestling in front of about 200 fans mm -hmm. in Wyvern Hall, a little community center as part of the leisure center. And now in front of our biggest crowd ever. And who knows how big it can get because this is the last week and this is a time when people are making up their minds. So who knows how big this thing can get. But regardless of if we sell another ticket or we don't, this is the biggest crowd that Revolution Pro Wrestling has ever performed in front of. So it's history. And you get the opportunity to be a part of that history. So, look, I can't say any more. If you're, if you're not motivated, if you're not pumped up and excited to come to the 11-year anniversary show after hearing that, then can you really call yourself a wrestling fan? And Look, if you can't be there, we're going to be streaming it live on revproondemand.com. Um, and you know, I can't guarantee it. I think the live stream is going to be cool because we've live streamed a lot of shows now, right? Yeah. But you get the uh, straight after the live stream. We're not charging any extra money. So we could do this as a standalone pay-per-view. We could take it to fight, right? But my mentality is, again... We might get less people watching this way because it's a less familiar platform, but my mentality is growth, progression, moving the business forward, creating a solid foundation. I want people to see our on-demand service. You subscribe, and in your first month subscription, that show will be included, and it's included if you've already subscribed as well. There's no additional fee for that show. The show will air live um, shortly after the show's finished. Um, the replay of the show, the low quality stream version of the show will, will, will appear shortly after the show's finished, if you've missed anything. Um, and then um, the following day, or maybe the Monday, we'll see, you know, it, it, it's, we'll see if the technical gods are smiling on us or not. Yeah. Um, but, you know, within 48 hours, you're going to get an HD high quality version of a show, um, which will replace that live stream of a show as well. So that's on RevPro On Demand. Dot com but honestly if you can be there live absolutely be there live because it's going to be all kinds of special absolutely thank you so much andy and i will see you on saturday i look forward to oh tickets revolutionprowrestling.com as well revolutionprowrestling.com yeah i will put a, a link in the description for that <laughs>